Welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. My name is Nick Limsdahl. My guest this week is Simone Silva. Simone is the head of consumer services, experience, and operations for Whirlpool Corporation in North America. Simone, welcome to the Press One for Nick podcast. Thank you, Nick. It's my pleasure to be here. So the first question I ask every single guest at the very beginning is what's one thing people might not know of you? I put some thoughts on what you offer you <laughs> on that question. Uh, and I think uh, it is the fact that I am an avid traveler. I've been to 43 countries. And whenever I travel, I like to just blend in with the locals and really leave the culture and let the culture of the place around me. I think that uh, speaks a lot to how I try to work every day in customer service. So really this idea of being surrounded by a culture and, and living and breathing it. But yes, uh, I am an avid traveler and that was a big challenge during the pandemic, not being able to go places. <laughs> I'm sure we'll, we'll definitely talk about challenges here in, in, the, in the coming questions. Uh, but the follow-up question with that, of course, is if you could leave, if you could go to one more place and you could never travel again, but you could go to one more place, what would it be? It would probably be uh, Bora Bora in, <laughs> in Tahiti. That is Just a good one. Just the thought of good... being over, wa over uh, water in an overwater bungalow and relaxing, that, that really makes me dream about it. Amazing. I, I'm, I may or may not be uh, going to YouTube after this recording uh, and just looking at Bora Bora. But uh, here and there, uh, let's, uh, let's chat about uh, kind of some of those challenging times that you have faced throughout the pandemic is, um, you know, one of the things that we all struggle with as consumers were to face the, the organizations who just said, I'm sorry, I can't deal with this, or I can't, here's what I can't do instead of here's what I can. And um, so how are you training for empathy during a lot of these challenging times that we're, we've had over the, the past few years? Yeah, like many, the pandemic put our strategy, but not just the strategy, our purpose, our culture, everything at test. And the one thing that we knew day one is that that was not going to be our answer to anything. Uh, we always uh, held the position that uh, home appliances, most people might not think of them as essential products but they are essential products. And if you think about some use cases, the person who is diabetic and needs a refrigerator to keep their medicine, or a person who is working hard, crazy hours in healthcare and needs to get home, doesn't know what he or she is dealing with and needs to get their, uh, their laundry done every single day because they don't know what kind of germs they are bringing to their house. For those people, having their appliances up and running was essential. And we knew that's something that we had to law before, and we were very successful on the federal level, on the state levels, on the mun different municipalities to educate and justify the essential uh, uh, aspect of our uh, business. And that in itself uh, let us play a role, let us be in business in those difficult times. Uh, as we overcame that initial battle, if you will, uh, we had to have the right uh, processes and infrastructure. So we had to adjust very fast. Uh, our contact center, as an example, we virtualized 2000 agents over 48 hours, which was amazing. And some of my, our competitors were not as lucky. They weren't as ready, but we had years of uh, scaling up our virtual capabilities and they were there. They were on point where when we needed them. And likewise, our service network. We have a, a group of about 7,000 technicians out in the field going to people's homes, repairing their appliances. They were just as scared as any of us in staying in business. So we had to find the right resources like uh, doctors who could talk to them on the best way to be on the road safely and still delivering this very critical job that they have every day of uh, keeping people's appliances up and running. So uh, we learned a lot, that's for sure. And, but, and we were successful in uh, navigating through those difficult times with a lot of creativity and uh, 
leveraging on what we've learned over the past few years to get us ready for it. Yeah, we definitely have all learned a lot throughout that over the last few years of what to do and maybe what not to do and some lessons learned along the way. But, you know, I, I thought it was what you mentioned a little bit. It was the 2000 agents over 48 hours was that's, that's pretty crazy to mm-hmm. regardless of if you have uh, a cloud-based system or not um, transitioning them out, just the logistics, making sure they have strong connectivity, uh, making sure what that process looks like, how to measure them. So um, maybe what was, what was the struggle um, yeah, and or think, lessons learned? Yeah, I think to better answer that, I, I need to give you a little bit of context on how we prepared, how we had the infrastructure at the point that it was at when we really needed to, to make that fast move. Uh, back in 2016, uh, one very insightful leader that I have in the team, uh, Sandy Morrison is, is her name, She's probably one of the most uh, customer centric persons that I've I've ever met. And we talk a lot about uh, human centered experiences in the context of consumers, but that is the uh, human centered experience in the the context of employees too. So back in 2016, uh, she was starting to have, she leads our contact center for consumer facing contacts. And she was struggling to really hire in the local markets where Whirlpool had a traditional brick and mortar footprint. And then thinking about the problem, she had this epiphany of why do we wanna bring people to work for us where we are? Why don't we bring then the jobs where they are and they wanna leave? So with that thought in mind, her first uh, trial was to approach uh, some military bases in uh, Florida and Georgia. So she visited those military bases and actually offered remote jobs for military families. Very flexible, flexible on hours. Uh, She had uh, situations where two stay at home moms who were living there nearby a military base uh, had the choice of uh, working shifts, somebody working in the morning and the other one picking up in the afternoon. And they asked, is that even a possibility? And we said, yes, if you are willing to work for us and you can commit to great uh, customer service, you are in. So that model started in 2016. Uh, it was very successful. And uh, we've been growing that over time. So today we are over 26 states. And when the pandemic happened and we felt the need to go virtual, uh, we honestly only had to do some uh, tests with our technology to make sure it was capable of uh, having all the 2000 employees uh, working remote, but we already had a lot of learnings accumulated over what, four years of experimenting and bringing jobs to remote locations. And that model has also created variants of like, college students, uh, retirees, or people approaching retirements who are who are n- not ready yet to completely stop working, but want to start slowing down with a part-time job. So that's something that we've been flirting with for the last couple of years and one of our competitive advantages during the pandemic. I think that was amazing. You said you started that in 2016? Mm-hmm. That's, that, that was uh, not normal of bringing people remotely and or having that flex schedule in 2016 in any industry. Um, Mm -hmm. And so kudos to you guys. Uh, One of the things I did notice that you guys have a Whirlpool Veterans Association, did that also start in 2016 or was the WVA uh, transpired from The WVA is uh, a little bit older than that. So Whirlpool is very committed to military families and military personnel. In different uh, functions at Whirlpool, we welcome uh, veterans to join our teams, uh, consumer services included. But yes, this program was really tailored to uh, the needs of military families because once they get that job, if uh, their uh, service takes them places, their wives or or kids can take their jobs with them. And and we are very proud of it. Uh, WVA was actually 
uh, a sponsor for, for us to get access to, to the military bases, make that first contact. And together, my organization and WVA, we were uh, recognized by the White House uh, for this program. They This happened last year, so in or 2021. Uh, they, they really believed that uh, instead of just having quotas of an X percent of uh, our regular vacancies uh, reserved to um, military or uh, uh, people in, in the reserve, we actually had a program that was designed around uh, military families and their needs. So we're very proud of it. But like I said, uh, WVA it was uh, our partner in executing the program. Yeah, that's that's very cool. It's great to hear and uh, the commitment to that as well. You know, one of the other commitments that you guys have is at Whirlpool is that you've always kept your customer service reps in the U.S. mainland. And mm-hmm. I, I think that's amazing, but I'd love to get your thoughts on on how that, what made you decide to do that? Mm-hmm. Uh, Yes, uh, this is definitely not mainstream. We are part of an industry where that's very pressured uh, for cost. And we've seen a lot of companies pursuing that best cost model and and partnering with BPOs overseas. That's definitely not our model. Uh, Whirlpool has Midwestern roots. And if you call our contact center, you'll feel like you are talking to a family member. It's not scripted at all. And we really want uh, to have consumers understand that they are being supported by someone who is empathetic to what they are going through, who understands the, the products or services that they, they need help with very well, who have accent that is similar to what they are used to in the U.S. mainland. It's a huge country and that that is a variety there, but people who can relate to the same seasons of the year, to what is going on in the world. Uh, One of the things that happened in the pandemic that we we just bared the impact, but we, we lived with it is we've seen our handle times going up by two minutes just with people sharing their experiences in the pandemic when when trying to talk to our agents. They would talk about uh, their fears, their uh, anxieties and what they were going through and then bring up what they needed help with. And we encouraged empathy in those situations because that really speaks to who we are as a customer support organization. That speaks to uh, what Whirlpool is as a... an American company. So the decision of keeping the uh, customer service organization in the US mainland has a lot to do with the level of support that we want to provide. We want that one uh, phone call or chat interaction that you you have with us to be very effective, to go from understanding what your problem is, work through solutions with you, and providing you with a resolution at the end and not as transactional as screening what your problem is, promising you a, a response later and getting back to you with what that solution uh, can be. Is a customer service agent, I'm sure that obviously not in your guys' contact center, but if they see the countdown of, hey, you can only have so long to have this interaction and the countdown is going down and you're still tr- trying to provide that empathy. Uh, it, I, I don't know what that feels like, but being able to increase your, your handle times to solve the problem in the channel of their choice and just listen to them, uh, it, it goes, you know, so far for the customer who's actually on the other end of the phone, instead of actually feeling like a family member, not necessarily as a number to the organization, something else as a consumer, it's, it's frustrating when, somebody does say that's not my that's not my issue that's not my that's not the company policy and i think one of our conversations you talked about how you've allowed the team members to kind of bring themselves to the conversation and empower them Uh, maybe share a little bit about that yeah uh, like uh, any large corporation and with a large contact center we uh, are very committed to compliance and we have policies we have procedures and we measure our teams uh, against that, but we also offer a toolkit to to that agent who is interacting with the consumer to walk through some possibilities. Part of it is technology enabled uh, 
with information on every past interaction we've already had with that consumer or on that particular serial number uh, product that uh, we know how far along we are in the life of that appliance. So we have all that in the fingertips of the agent, but we do offer us, uh, offer a uh, resolution tree with a couple of options and we educate those team members to walk through them. We also uh, make some experiments by monitoring the uh, what we, we have going on at the moment, like in the event of a, a large supply chain disruption that the likelihood of uh, a certain type of call to end up on a product replacement at the very end. Why wait so long? Uh, we try to customize the, the call flow in those situations to really bring up front uh, a resolution that might be uh, the, the best choice for a consumer and not keep somebody going through uh, a very painful process just to stick to the policy. We've been successful doing that. Uh, of course, it requires a lot of oversight and managing our cost and but at the end of the day uh, our purpose is to serve service uh, is to provide a good service to, to that consumer who calls and empathy is our number one goal in those interactions so we we try as much as possible to empower our team members to play with the variables that they're uh, offered in the tool in the uh, toolbox that's great I had no idea we were having list logistic issues across the, the world uh, is news to me. <laughs> one of the one of the questions I kind of want to get back to is as a consumer, regardless of if we're making appliance purchases, those are some of the bigger purchases that we'll, that we'll ever make. Obviously the house and car, probably a little bit higher than that. But what does that buying process look like uh, as, a, as a consumer when interacting with Whirlpool? Uh, it's very interesting because you, you said it correct. Uh, it's probably the third uh, price tag item when you think about the most common purchases everybody uh, makes, but it's the one or, or, or the first or the second that will stick around for the longest. So you make a choice today for a product that we will be using and living with and looking at it inside of your kitchen for the next five, seven years. <laughs> so you don't think that way when you are purchasing a car that you have the ability to change every year or every other year. But having said that, the most traditional uh, appliance shopper will shop for new appliance in three different situations. And their choices are very different depending on what uh, triggered that uh, consideration. Uh, you have, of course, people who are buying new homes. And in that scenario, they, they look at uh, the design, the look and feel of their products the most, but the appliances are one item in a variety of other things that they are selecting for, for that home. So it might not get all the attention and all the consideration of how that appliance will really uh, match the, the needs of the family or the individual who's making the, the home purchase because a lot of decisions are being made at the same time right there. Uh, then uh, you have the people who are working on renovations. So somebody who has already some experience with existing appliances, some might be good, some might be bad, and they are making very informed decisions. Uh, they are looking for appliances that fit not just the, the look and feel of what they want that new kitchen uh, to, to be after the renovation is done, but uh, really that's when they start to consider more the, the function and features uh, and their, uh, what works best for their household. And then you have people in situations of duress, uh, somebody who has uh, kids to feed and a whole family to take care of and a refrigerator who is out of order or a washing machine that's not uh, working and they need to go dry cleaning or to a, a laundromat to, to do their laundry. Of course, the need for speed and uh, quick fulfillment of orders, those are other elements that start to be part of the consideration set that are not as present in the, in the other two situations. But it's uh, very interesting to understand consumer motivation in each one of those three scenarios. Yeah, that's such a fascinating journey too, because 
you know, uh, just two nights ago, our power went out because of a storm and we're, we're without power for like two hours. And immediately we're thinking what's in the freezer, what's in the fridge, you know, what's not going to work when we turn this thing back on. And uh, thankfully everything turned on and we don't have medical supplies that, that we need to refrigerate or, or um, take care of, but it's definitely uh, frightening when you think of uh, some of the things that are mission critical for a person uh, who needs things um, like that. Um, so what does that look like from that journey? Because nobody wants to fill out an application. It's like uh, buying life insurance. You fill out an application and they just get bombarded by people trying to sell you something. But uh, when it comes to buying an appliance, it's hopefully you're not necessarily in dis- duress where it is more of an emergency and you're kind of just saying what's best available uh, and can I get it the quickest? Um, so what does that look like? Let's say it is a couple weeks out, uh, depending on what that budget is and, and uh, features and functionality, but how are you helping consumers through that buying journey? Sure. Well, well for each one of those um, use cases or, or those personas, uh, we have a, a couple of uh, solutions that we've worked uh, through over the years like for the new home buyers, we have a great partnership with builders all over the country where we have uh, defined portfolios of products available to builders to offer to consumers whenever they are going through the process of making their selections for for a new home. So uh, marketing materials will be uh, customized to that particular channel where we don't want to overwhelm a consumer. We want to have their attention span to go into every single detail of uh, a product, but we do training with uh, builders and contractors who can really represent us well in making recommendations on what you choose. So that's one possibility. Uh, For people who are uh, taking their time to work on their renovations, hopefully not in a situation of the rest, they have something that's working currently for them, but they want to make informed decisions. Uh, Actually, early on in the pandemic. It, was, it wasn't it was planned to be <laughs> in, in the pandemic, but it just happened to be that way. We launched a virtual assistant for uh, make vers- for a, a, a repair versus a replace a decision uh, tree. If you go to our websites, if you go to whirlpool.com, you can uh, leverage some of that technology to help you make a decision. So you basically, answer a few questions about your your household, the type of uh, appliance user you are. You are more practical and just want the job done, or you really want to entertain in your kitchen and invite friends and experiment. So, and by answering those questions, uh, we might uh, be able to make a recommendation and filter out some uh, products, SKUs that might not be the best option for you and uh, recommend some other ones. Or if you have work in appliances, the set of questions will uh, guide you towards uh, maintaining or repairing uh, your appliances for the case of the consumer in the rest, or really uh, pursue a a replacement. And then if replacement is the case, uh, we do have all of our uh, brands with uh, the exception of Genair currently, with e-commerce available in our websites where we sell directly to consumers, but uh, our main stream uh, model is still to operate uh, through our retail partners and we have presence uh, nationwide through great partnerships that we have with trade partners. It's so, it's so refreshing because I can go to all these big box stores where I can talk to the, the handyman who is trying to repair the one that I currently have and ask them, Hey, what do you guys think? What, what is the best based off of what you know? And some of them will give us sound advice. And, but if I can have a, a toolkit like that, that says, what are you looking for? Are you more of a techie and you want to see inside your fridge? Do you have a, a family of how many, five, six, uh, what are you trying to accomplish? And then it's not, it's not selling the technology or the, the appliance first. It's working backwards to the appliance. And yeah. I think that's, that's refreshing. I, we all don't want to be sold to, but we love that process. 
And you know, I, I think it goes back to the human-centered experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, if we are living at a time where we have four or five different generations out in the market shopping for appliances. Not all of them will take the same path in understanding their options and making their selections. You might have a generational set there who enjoy that conversation with their handyman, somebody they trust who, who has been through their house multiple times. That's why in all the solutions that we design and develop, we try not to make it uh, one single path because yeah. the, the digital experience, somebody who goes through the website and tries to, and is okay answering questions to uh, be guided through a process to make a decision might be the best option for uh, a millennial or a Gen Z who is making that first appliance purchase of their lives, but not necessarily to a baby boomer who has been through that process a couple of times. They know exactly what they want and they uh, trust the opinion uh, of a professional or a friend that uh, they, they've known for, for years. So we try to understand that those are the dynamics of the market and have solutions that fit uh, each and every uh, one of these uh, different personas and use cases. I like that. So when it comes to consumers, a lot of times the customer service people specifically don't have the ability to maybe hear a broad stroke of the success stories. The, hey, this is what happened. I got, um, here's how they came into the organization. Here's the problem that they had. Here's how I talked them down and provided empathy. And here's what we ended up doing at the end. Um, so how important is it to actually share internally those success stories of your customers? Uh, it is very important because that's, uh, that line of uh, that continuous supply and fuel to the fire to for for our employees to continue doing great every single day uh, it is a tough job it is it is tough to be in the front lines dealing with uh, people who are disappointed frustrated upset with things that are not going well but we try to echo and uh, really share those success stories we we have uh, some that are just amazing and it blows my mind whenever I, I walk down uh, the hallway and I see some of our employees receiving wedding invitations of people that they supported in a very difficult uh, moment when they said, oh, I had a rehearsal dinner that I, I was cooking for uh, 30 people and I, I had a broken oven and your technician showed up on time and got it repaired and you saved that rehearsal dinner. Here you go, we would love to have you uh, join us for, for the wedding. So we have those stories <laughs> or baby pictures. And those are the, the things that uh, keep us going. I, I tell that uh, everybody can once get a job in customer service, but to stay happy and, and enjoying your uh, experience waking up in the morning with a smile on your face, you need to have uh, a passion for it. You need to have something in your heart or a willingness to help and give and support that is unique to professionals of, of this industry. But we have plenty of success stories and I am personally committed to make that uh, part of our goals this year, to make them as visible as uh, we possibly can, not just for the employees, uh, of consumer services at, at Whirlpool, but also broadly. It's, uh, if you look at Whirlpool's vision statement, we call for improving life at home. And I honestly think that our products have that ability to improve life at home. But how do we make every single employee at Whirlpool sitting in all different business functions understand that they play an important role in improving life at home? So I think the, the power of those positive stories uh, is not just for people like myself and my team working in customer service, but for every single Whirlpool employee, because we all, we all play a role. Yeah, there should almost be a, a recap, a highlight reel video that shows at the end of the year and just says, here's the things that you guys have done to, to make it, you know, to, to align with our mission statement. Um, I, I think those are so cool of the, it should be on your HR policy where anytime you put out a, a job post, it should be that a video of those wedding invitations and baby pictures and 
this isn't about this isn't about a job. This is about, you know, making life better at home. And yeah. uh, we, we started we, we started with uh, our post pandemic version of consumer connected tours, which is something we've always loved doing. And that is no place where you can understand the customer experience that Whirlpool provides more than if you walk the floors of a contact center, if you go on a ride along with a technician to someone's home to repair their product, because that's the experience being built right there live. And uh, of course, during the two, two and a half years of the pandemic, we had to pause with any uh, tours and, and visits to consumers' home. We wouldn't uh, risk that. But we are getting back in, into it. And it's always an amazing experience when you bring uh, people from areas like uh, HR, finance, supply chain, and put them through the hopes of, okay, when a, a complaint comes in, that's how we handle it. And by the way, when people talk about us on social media, that's, what, that's how we analyze what they are saying, positive and negative sentiment. And come here now and pilot a desk, listen by yourself what consumers are sharing with us about their lives, about disruptions in their day-to-day -day lives, what kind of resolution would you provide? So we love doing that. And it's so impactful because it, it really demonstrates uh, how we can improve life at home. I think that's great because you're the, the cross, the, if it doesn't matter if it's HR or marketing or operations or sales, you're saying, this is the, this is the customer. Hear it from them and hear the pain point and frustrations that they're having. And then let's collectively solve that together. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish all organizations uh, were, were closer aligned to the Whirlpool uh, mission of, of customer service. So um, I, I wrap up every single podcast, Simone, with two questions. And the first one is, what book or person in customer service or customer experience has influenced you the most in the last year? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I would pick the Service Culture Handbook. So I think that... We'll, with how things have rapidly changed in the last two years with the pandemic, we are all in need of a, a reset. Let's check our culture and make sure that uh, it is still delivering what we need to our consumers. So that, that book is all about going back to the basics, very simple ways to assess how uh, customer centric your organization really is. And in case it is not, with some very helpful hints on how to improve that. So easy read, and very insightful. Great book, great book. Um, and the last question I have for you is if you could leave a note to every single customer service professional across the world, it's gonna hit everybody's desk Monday at 8 a.m., what would it say? Align your actions to your heart. It's easy to know uh, how to do the right thing when you align your, your actions to your heart. So the policy shouldn't uh, be a reason not to do the right thing. Mm. I really like that because one of the questions I asked earlier was how are you allowing your team members to, to solve customers' problems? And I think that fits it perfectly, aligning your actions to your heart. Uh, mm -hmm. Simone, what's the best way for people to follow Whirlpool or to connect with you? Uh, well, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and I welcome contacts that way. I, I got to be careful. I don't know what this will mean to me after <laughs> you publish this podcast, but uh, I try to, to be very responsive uh, to people on, on LinkedIn personally. And uh, Warpool is very active on social media. We are omni-channel. So I said it earlier, any channel of choice to our consumers will be there uh, for them. Uh, you name it. It's Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, or the traditional uh, phone chat email. So there is always a way to get in touch with us. But uh, me personally, LinkedIn would be the channel. That's great. Thank you so much, Simone. I've enjoyed our time and best of luck to you here in 23. Thank you, Nick. All the best to you too.